In 2018, AP Biology students were in for quite a surprise on the free response question section. Watch this video and find out why. Hi everyone, my name is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy, and today we're finally moving on to Unit 2, which is Chapter 6 and Chapter 7 on cells and cell membranes. Now, Chapter 6 is a pretty boring chapter because all they do is give you a tour of the cell, which is literally the title of the chapter, but it just introduces a lot of these organelles without diving deeply into exactly what they do. So it's a bit of a tricky chapter to teach and learn. However, there was one concept from Chapter 6 that was really critical to answering one of the FRQ on the 2018 exam, and that is the topic of today's video, which is cell fractionation. So let's talk a little bit about cell fractionation because you never know when it's going to come out again. So what is cell fractionation? Well, it's a technique in biology to separate different components of the cell based on their mass. And you might want to do this if you're a scientist investigating a particular component of the cells. Let's face it, cells are pretty small. So let's say that you're studying the mitochondria. Well, it's not like you can take tweezers to pluck out the mitochondria that you want from the cell. So in order to segregate the different components of the cell, we're going to be learning about cell fractionation. So cell fractionation involves the multi-step centrifugation of the cell in order to separate different components of the cell by mass. So we're gonna first start off by talking a little bit about centrifugal force. So have you guys ever been to an amusement park on a UFO ride? Now I know that the UFO rides can come in different varieties, but there was this one particular ride I remember from my childhood where we stand against the wall of the outer ring of this little UFO machine, and as the whole thing spins, the floor drops, but yet you're still stuck on that wall. That is what we call centrifugal force. So if we're able to emulate that centrifugal force, we may be able to separate different materials inside the cell by mass. So here's how it's going to work. First, homogenize. We're going to homogenate the cell usually by physical means. This means that we might put the cells as well as some buffer solutions into a machine that grinds it up into what we call a homogenate. Now, don't worry, the grinding process is most likely not going to damage the things that you're gonna to wanna to study because it's kind of like trying to cut an apple with a crowbar. It's just not sharp enough to cut through the organelles. However, once we have that homogenate, we are going to take the entire thing, put it into what we call an Eppendorf tube and put them into the centrifuge machine. Now the centrifuge is simply an apparatus that spins those Eppendorf tubes and as it does so, it pushes the content down to the bottom of that tube. But the important thing is that we can set the amount of spin and the amount of time that we want to run the machine for. So the very first step in differential centrifugation is running the machine at about a thousand G, which means 1000 times the force of gravity for just about 10 minutes. Because when you do this, the only things that would be pushed up against the bottom of that Eppendorf tube are the very large substances. So things like the nuclei of cells or large cell debris are the only things that you'll find at the bottom of that Eppendorf tube. So what does that mean? Well, if you are a scientist who wants to isolate the nucleus, perhaps you want to extract DNA, maybe you're sort of a CSI type of individual. Then the pellet at the bottom of that Eppendorf tube is exactly what you're looking for. And the liquid suspension could be just simply thrown out, hopefully in a biohazard bin. However, if what you're looking for are components that are still smaller yet, then what you're gonna wanna do is take that liquid suspension that we call supernatant, pour it into a new Eppendorf tube because we're gonna spin that again, except this time at 20,000 G for about 20 minutes. Now, after 20 minutes, the only things that you'll have at the bottom are the things that are still larger than majority of the other substances in that supernatant. So these are going to include things like mitochondria, chloroplasts if you're working with plant cells, or other debris about that size. So for instance, if you're a scientist studying mitochondria, then the pellet is exactly what you want to isolate. In fact, this is exactly how we discovered that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. However, let's suppose that you want things that are smaller yet. Then what you're gonna to wanna to do is to take that supernatant, put it into a new tube, and this time spin it at 80,000 G for 60 minutes. Then at the end of the 60 minutes, what you're gonna have at the bottom of that Eppendorf tube are what we call microsomes, which are large fragments of the cell's membrane. 
Okay, but let's say that you want to go even smaller. Maybe you're interested in ribosomes. Now, ribosomes are very, very small. So how do we do that? We take the supernatant, which presumably still includes all the things that are lighter than microsomes, and we're gonna spin it at a walloping 100,000 G for three hours. And after those three hours are done, what you'll have at the bottom are pellets that are filled with ribosomes and other small substances around that size. So it seems pretty simple. However, sometimes I get students asking me, well, why don't we just spin the whole cell homogenate at 100,000 G for three hours to begin with? Well, because if you do that without removing any of the intermediate sizes in between, you're going to have all of the cells content pelleted at the bottom of that Eppendorf tube. So spinning that cell homogenate at progressively higher and higher and higher Gs, you're able to then further separate smaller and smaller and smaller substances yet inside the cell. So this sounds pretty simple, but it's also one section of chapter six that a lot of students and even teachers miss. However, in 2018, we had a question like this. So this was the second long form question on the 2018 FRQ. And take a look, we're looking at cell fractionation as displayed here with the whole cell sample, fraction one, fraction two, fraction three, and fraction four. And I just wanna kind of go through this question quickly with you guys, because I want you to understand how significant cell fractionation is in understanding the logistics of solving this question. So the question was something like this. We know what this NF-kappa B protein is. It's an immune response protein. However, they want you to know where it is in the cell. And clearly in the whole cell sample, you can see that whether we're talking about this protein called aconitase, which is a Krebs cycle protein, DNA polymerase, GADPH, a glycolytic protein, or sodium potassium pump, or NF-kappa B, that's of course gonna be found in the whole cell sample because it just contains everything. However, what we'll notice is that NF-kappa B protein exists in fraction two and fraction three. And the way that we're gonna solve this mystery is by isolating where these two proteins are, which would be the GAPDH and DNA polymerase, which will give us an answer to where NF-kappa B is found simultaneously. Now, just so that you guys are aware, we didn't talk about all of these things yet in AP Biology at the onset of unit two. So if you don't know, that's okay. But because many students come to AP Biology after having studied ninth grade biology, I will mention that if we're talking about the Krebs cycle, for instance, that's part of cell respiration, which means that the Krebs cycle protein, which is a conotase, is going to be in the mitochondria, which means that the fraction one contains bits of the mitochondria. Now, DNA polymerase, well, this is an enzyme that copies DNA. And as you guys may be aware, DNA resides within the nucleus. So wherever the DNA polymerase may be, we know that it's the nucleus. Now, GAPDH, a glycolytic protein, another very important idea because glycolysis, which is a universal process, happens inside the cytoplasm. So we know that GAPDH includes fragments of the cytoplasm. Now, lastly, we have the sodium potassium pump, and we're gonna learn this in chapter six very shortly, but the sodium potassium pump exists on the cell's membrane. So this is going to be our cell membrane. So based on these locations, we can then isolate NF-kappa B as existing in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And in fact, in the question, they actually tell you that this NF-kappa B protein was found in the cytoplasm until it was required for transcription. And they wanted you to explain that based on the information provided in the cell fractionation table. So that could be pretty challenging if you didn't know what cell fractionation was. And not only that, this is a brilliant question because it involves concepts from cell respiration as well as DNA replication, as well as sodium potassium pumps presence in the cell's membrane in chapter seven, meaning that in order to solve this question properly, it would have required at least three to four chapters of study and synthesizing those different ideas together. And that is how real AP biology free response questions are. They always require you to synthesize ideas from multiple units. And that is precisely why I wanted to make a separate video for cell fractionation because of how important it was in 2018. Now I can't guarantee that in 2023, you're gonna have any questions similar to this. But that being said, 
If College Board thought it was important at one point, you just never know if it's going to come out again. And none of us, whether we're teachers or students, could make predictions about what content is going to show up in the FRQ. So it's very beneficial to be as prepared as possible. Now, in subsequent videos, I will go into Chapter 6 in greater detail, talking about organelles and the other auxiliary ideas that are involved in understanding that chapter. And of course, we'll go through Chapter 7. But I wanted to start off this unit with a little bit more of an interesting example. So so there it was, solve fractionation, guys. I hope that was helpful, and we'll see you guys in the next video. My name is Mikey. Please subscribe and like this video for more content like this. We'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.